everyone. Welcome to day three of the Virtual Guitar Summit. This is the first year we're doing this. Hopefully we'll do more. Uh, so far, I'm having a blast, so I hope you are too. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today, we have a special day. We have our special workshop by a very good friend who's sitting in the green room. I can see him, you can't. <laughs> but before I introduce you to you all know Sam Bell. Before I introduce you to Sam, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping really quick. This uh, series of workshop is, well, it's live right now if you are in the room. If not, you can watch the replays on YouTube and Facebook for just a few days. Then they're going to be removed. They're going to really be removed, but you can get access to lifetime, uh, the lifetime access to all the replays if you'd like and a chance to win this brand new um, PRS SE24 custom guitar. It's out of the box because I wanted to show you and I played it just a couple times because I couldn't resist, but it's uh, an awesome guitar offered by PRS Guitars and Sweetwater. And uh, stick till the end because uh, today we're going to give away some gear from Universal Audio and D'Addario. Stay at the end. Now, I want to address something really quick. I had a few emails as far as uh, how do you enter this? Um, because I ask people to comment in order to um, participate. People are a little confused as to how to comment. So this is, if you're watching this, there are three possible uh, ways to watching this. You're either watching this on YouTube or on Facebook or you already registered for the replays, and this is actually streaming right now on uh, the Guitar Playback website. And you probably registered and you might be watching there, which is great, but if you're watching on Guitar Playback, you can't comment. So you need to make sure to check your email. I just sent an email to you if you're registered, and you need to be on YouTube or Facebook. And in order to comment, if you don't know where to comment on Facebook or YouTube, most likely you are not logged in. Uh, in. I think you need to be logged in on Facebook, but you need to be logged in on YouTube. So if you don't have an account, you still have time to do that, create a free account on YouTube. That's the only way you can comment and that's the way you can win the prize. Okay, so with that being said, I'm going to fix something here on uh, the Facebook feed really quick because it looks like there might be a little issue here, but we can fix that really quick and then we'll get started. Uh, with Sam. Now, the replays will be available for a limited time, like I said, and um, okay, that's fixed. And that's it. We'll have time for questions after. So hopefully you have your guitar because it's always good to take notes if you want, but even better than that, once Sam explains something, if, you, if it triggers an idea, that's really where you're going to make the most of it. So have your guitar in your hand if you can. And uh, this guy in the back is an amazing player, amazing educator. I met him, gosh, it's been a very long time. Uh, you know what, I'll bring him in. Maybe he can remind me. Hey, Sam. <laughs> Hi, David, pleasure to be here. <laughs> yeah, same here. Man, I was, uh, I, was, I was trying to think about that earlier, and I think it was at the very beginning of my YouTube channel, I probably had some, I had some uh, contests, some uh, play, like playing over backing track stuff. And you entered one of them, and I was like, "Man, like, why? Why does this guy enter my contest? He's <laughs> too good for that." Oh. And but that is the first time. That was like probably more than ten years ago, it seems like. And ever since, I've been a fan of your work. So I'm, I'm thrilled you're here, man. It's amazing to me that you're here. It really is. Well, thank you very much for having me. No, I, I was an avid follower from the early days. I saw the picture actually you shared on social media of early YouTube. Um, yeah, guitar playback, and I used to, I, I still get a lot out of your videos even now as an educator myself. And uh, yeah, you kind of helped me a lot on my path. So oh, thank, thank you. you, man. Thank you. Well, without further ado, I'm going to leave. I'm going to let you do your thing, and I might interject with some questions. Some questions, um, mm -hmm. and then at the end, we'll have time for Q and A, and we'll do the giveaways and all that. So, enjoy, everyone. Sam, it's your turn. <laughs> yep, wrong one. I always do this. <laughs> Hi everybody, I hope everyone's doing fantastically. And um, like David said, if you have a guitar with you, that's gonna be pretty helpful. Um, 
in this session, I want to talk about the use of arpeggios. And I think sometimes they can be quite mystical, especially if you're in your early sort of stages of playing guitar. Uh, arpeggio, triad, chord, these words get thrown about a lot. And um, they all basically mean the same thing. So um, my way of understanding guitar has been through trial and error. And um, my understanding is my understanding. So maybe some of what I might say might gel, some of it might not. But I'd encourage you to to investigate along the path. What I'm trying to outline today is a kind of if you're if you're doing some pentatonic solos and you're just about to sort of get into the modes in the major scale, um, this is probably a good area to look at, and it should hopefully give you at least a path of investigation in your own playing. So, first of all, what is a triad or an arpeggio? It's, this is arpeggios 101, and and you know a classical music dictionary would probably tell you an arpeggio is a chord uh, the notes played separately i play of less delay so that is an arpeggio so we're just playing an open c chord that's an arpeggio that's the arpeggio of c and another word you might hear often is the word triad which just means a three note chord as in three different notes in case of c major you've got c d Sorry, you've got C, E, <laughs> G, okay? I pretend I know what I'm on about. Okay, so C, E, G. And obviously, that that wherever I play C major, if I know different ways of playing that triad, I can play it around the neck. Now, we're probably used to playing triads as chords, especially in the early times of playing guitar, you have your... Now, if you've experimented with some other sort of solos and things, you might find you hear things like this. Um, so those sort of lines, which don't sound scalic, they sound different, or maybe even better, I don't know if this will get a copyright strike, but I'll stop there. Um, things like that, that is a arpeggio. When you hear um, that sort of thing, or the or the sweet picking and things like that. Those are arpeggios, triads, or chords, basically, the outlining chord tones. So without further ado, um, let's look at how we can start to, to see the fretboard and understand like, how, how to use arpeggios in the first place. Like I remember learning the sort of Van Halen tapping thing and really believing that the notes came from outer space, as in it was nothing to do with anything else I was doing on the guitar. I was playing... Bob Dylan songs and, you know, Thin Lizzy sort of power chord stuff, but without the solos, unfortunately, at the time. And when I heard the Van Halen stuff with the tapping, I thought it was different, but it's just the notes of a triad laid out in a different way. However, we've got to start somewhere to understand the theoretical aspect of, of all of this. So I'm going to put a clean tone on. And today I'm going to be working in the key of C major. Now, what my advice would be here is if there's anything that I say that you go, what? What was that? I don't understand that concept or, or the word. Then feel free to ask a question, but also make a note of that. Uh, that is really helpful for finding exactly what you need to practice straight away, especially if you're wondering what to practice. That's like, as soon as you go, hmm, what do I need to practice? There you are. That's it. Or sorry, hmm, I don't know what that means. That is the, that's productive to go there to look at that subject in the most simplest way possible. And uh, then you'll you'll gain something new. So, um, okay, let's look at the, uh, the key of C major. Um, we're going to take uh, a pattern. I'm just going to take this position of C major. So we have three and five on the A string, which are the notes C and D. That's the root. That's the second. We just we just number the the, the 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 notes by you know numbers one two okay, and then the D string we have two four and sorry two three and five. So that's three four five in the in the scale one two three four five, and then on the on the uh, G string we have two four five. Talking about frets here. Sorry, I know this can be a bit like lots of numbers flying everywhere. So. Three five, two three five, two four five. Now I'm not going to spend too long on the positions and stuff. You can play C major however you want to, but if you take the first note, skip the next note, 
play the next note, skip the next note, play the next note, you get a C major arpeggio. Now, if a song, um, if you're building a song, you can build songs from the chords that come out of the C major scale in this case. So each note gives you the seven chords, seven uh, chords of the major scale. So you get things like this, C major. The second chord would be D minor. Third chord would be E minor. Four and five would be would be majors, so you've got F and G. So C, D minor, E minor, F, G. A minor is your sixth chord, and we're going to be using that sixth chord today to demonstrate some of the concepts that I use for soloing with, with triads, because that's the relative minor, A minor, C major, that kind of thing. Um, and then up here at the 14th fret, this is a bit of a weird one. Uh, this is a diminished, B diminished triad. If uh, you're not familiar with that voicing, from the A to the B string, we've got 14, 15, 16, 15. So you've got like an A7 shape here, an A open A7 at the 15th fret. Then you've got the index finger on the 14 on the A, and then you've got the G string 16 on the G on the 16th fret. <laughs> okay, cool. So hopefully we're following along a bit, but basically we want to learn how to break these into patterns that we can play for single note melodies. That's kind of where we're going at today. Now, why why would you want to use these chords? Um, apart from to, obviously to use these chords to make songs, of course, you know, all that sort of stuff. And um, but for soloing, it kind of takes you away from that kind of pentatonic -y thing. You can add triads in all the time, and actually, we hear triads, chords, same thing. Uh, we hear triads and chords, arpeggios, we hear that all of the time in great solos. In fact, if you've ever played this kind of lick in a blues solo, you're playing a triad. You're sliding into a root note of A. You're grabbing a minor third of A. Then you're bending from here, the seventh fret, up to the fifth. So triads occur all the time, especially in vocal melodies. It's a it's a way of you can think of it another way, which I've found very helpful is triads break up your scale patterns. Okay, we'll look at how we do that in a moment. But first of all, let's just make let's I'd like to give you some practical ways of starting to investigate the fretboard visualization aspect of seeing just one triad. So um, we're gonna take C. Now, before before we little disclaimer, before we get into this, it would it helps. I mean, it's always helpful. I, mean, I think the way the guitar works is to understand how the cage system works in terms of chord voicing. So you have a C shape, you have your A shape of C, you have a G shape of C. That's not what people don't actually play this voicing like that. They use parts of it, especially if you hear that sort of thing. That's the G shape. You've got the E shape and the D shape, back to the C shape. So that's how they all connect together up the fretboard. If you know that, then, well, congratulations, you've kind of got most of, of this first part of the lesson. However, I think no matter how many ways you can play a pattern, sorry, no matter you know how well you know that, being able to break it down into smaller chunks is going to make it easier to use in different contexts, in lead and rhythm playing. So what we're going to do is we're going to break these shapes into three string voicings. So you end up with this. So you end up with these three string voicings. So let, let me take you through them. Now I've actually prepared, there will be a uh, PDF available with this, which I'll send to David after the session, just demonstrating what I'm about to show you, which is just three voicings. We're gonna do this. So the first one, this is C major. We've got five on the G, five on the B, three on the high E string. That's the voicing. And we can play that as a chord. But in a scenario of playing lead, 
we can we can separate it. We're going to look at how we'd phrase of this in a moment. At the moment, we're just setting the table for dinner, making sure we've got a knife and fork and all the condiments ready, so that when we want to eat, we're ready to eat. We're not just going to sort of, I don't know, I'm thinking of mashed potato for some reason, eating it with my hands. It's not going to be the most practical thing just to dive in there. So we have to start by setting the table first. So forgive my analogies, but there we are, five, five, three. Shift it up and you get the inversion. So we take those, basically what's happening is these notes are kind of swapping order. So that was C, E, G. Now we've got E, G, C. So that's still C major. You've got a bar on the eighth fret, B and E, and you've got the ninth fret on the G. Then we move it up here to 12, 13, 12, which is a D shape. Not going to play the rest of that riff, but you get the idea. So, now the ongoing practice then would be to learn how to do that in C, and then you need to learn where the, the third of the chord is. So, departing from C major for a moment. Um, in fact, actually, let's let's do this another way. If we take the second chord of C major, which is D minor. Let's look at the minor shapes that we can do for D minor. So we have this shape. So this is the same kind of voicing as the C major shape. In fact, if I do C, C major to C minor, you notice how that E note went down one fret. So we had five, four, three. Okay, so but except, except what we're doing here is we're moving it up. The root note is now on the D string, uh, G string. 7th fret for the note D. Then we move it up here. This is the inversion, just 10th fret, one finger. We are the uh, very useful shape, that one. And then this one up here, the D minor shape, because everyone, you know, it's played D minor there, then you've got D minor here as well. So you've got 5, 1, minor 3rd. So that's one way of looking at arpeggios. Now, if you were uh, working on any kind of like sort of rock metal playing, um, even even things like sort of a very a very popular example of this actually is the Dire Straits solo, that sort of thing, or Eagles, um, Hotel California, and all all that stuff. There's loads of references. Um, the patterns that they're using come from these patterns that we're looking at here. But we're going to voice them as two string arpeggios. So we're going to use them as a kind of a basis to develop these ideas. Oops. Now we're starting to get a bit more leady, a bit more um, guitaristic sort of thing, especially if we're used to our pentatonic soloing. I don't know why I'm. <laughs> All of the licks that I play and annoy myself with have disappeared today. <laughs> but anyway, it's probably a good thing, actually, in the long run. But um, So we have the fifth fret on the B string. Index finger plays the third fret on the high E string. And we can jump up. Now, this might be a bit of a stretch, so obviously we could try this an octave higher if you want to. But just to show you relative to the patterns we were just looking at, we have five on the B, three on the E, eight on the high E string. So that's actually, in terms of intervals, you've got the third, fifth root. Let's just take that up an octave so it's a bit easier to play. That would mean you're starting off the 17th fret B string, then 15th fret high E, and then 20th fret on high E. Oops. Okay. And, you know, there's already, there's already a ton of... shred licks you can get out of that one um so that's the first one and as you can see we're taking that into this position here right there so um once we've got that we can move to the next position so then you end up having eight on the uh b eight on the high e string and 12 on the high e string if you know your bar chord of C, it just happens up the top of there. So if you know the songs in C, you can throw that in. Um, I think I just saw a question come up. 
about how do I incorporate the arpeggios into solo, and we are going to get to that. To uh, we are going to get onto that um, very quickly. In fact, in fact, actually, into rhythm playing was the question: how do you incorporate arpeggios into rhythm playing? And I guess um, the, 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 the I'm going to get to that. But the, the short answer is: once you know how to do it with lead, lead and rhythm to me uh, is all about emphasis rather than a separation because it's all the same stuff. You know, you might you've probably heard this riff. Or oh, what's um might a bit of Bob Marley there. Um those are arpeggios uh being used in the guitar line. That's one way of doing it with single notes. But as we're gonna get on to, and this is the big subject of today, I wanted to talk about using all the arpeggios from a key, developing lines. But also, the big subject here, I'm going to use a word here which scares some people, scared me when I first heard it, and it's the word superimposition, which is where we play triads above different bass notes and it gives you different chords. That sounds very complicated, and it's actually very simple when we come to it. But before we do that, I just want to establish the ground of what we're looking at. So what what's helpful to do, and this actually kind of goes into that um, rhythm playing question there, is that we get used to playing... Oh yeah, just give you the final one up here. This is the final two string C major. You've got 13 on the B, 12 and 15 on the high E string. Some of you who've attempted any kind of sweet picking will have seen that, that pattern right there. And in fact, if you're watching all the Jason Beckery, all of that stuff, that is all just these shapes just piled on top of each other. Um, but with the genius of Jason Becker, of course. So, um, okay, so now you've got C major going up on string pairs. Now, obviously, this could happen. There's some shapes which are easier than others. And your job is to find the ones that you like the sound and feel of. You know, if you even if you just take that or just there's already a lot of stuff that comes out of that, even your tapping arpeggios, you can just connect them all in one string. But you've just got three patterns to, to remember for, for the major arpeggio shape. So the exercise, once you've understood how to do the three string voicings and the two string voicings, then you want to take that through the diatonic scale. And this is where the chord, chord section comes out. So you end up with... Now, what's great, and just to go into arpeggios, let's say I have a song which goes. And I wanted to sort of embellish that a bit. I can use that, the, the, the inversions on different strings of D minor. So I can end up with. So I can start to like add fills, and it's just the arpeggio shapes, but I'm seeing them in these three string voicings. So that's for rhythm playing mostly, um, more more chordal rhythm playing, and then obviously single note arpeggios for more riff based um, arpeggio playing, um, uh, rhythm playing with arpeggios. So yeah, we'll, what we'll do is we'll just quickly recap that. So we have C major. D minor, so this is going to be that. I'm just going to use the first shape of the root note. So C major, 553. Five, three. D minor, 765. E minor, we have um, 987. Then we have C major, uh, F major, sorry. <laughs> More coffee needed. So we've got 10, 10, uh, 8. Move it up two frets, same shape. Same. This is the, this is the same shape as C and F, it's just 12, 12, 10. Then we have A minor, and then this is the weird one, and I'm not going to talk about this one too much today because I don't know if it, it's, it's definitely used, and it's, I use it a lot, but um, if this is all new to you, then start with just the first six of the seven chords for now, and then and at least learn this pattern as well, just the diminished from the root. So you've got 16, which is the root note, you've got 15 on a B and 13 on a high E string. So that's your B diminished triad. And what's great, actually, you know, if you've got like a, a, a tune as well. So 
kind of improvising riffs here, but I can use any of those triads relative to that root note, and I can kind of create melodic movements in my rhythm playing and in my lead playing. It's all uh, all good stuff, and it breaks the scale up. A lot, a lot of people, when they learn like a, a minor scale or a mode pattern, they learn the scale shape, which is good. You need to... It's, that has to be done. And it has to. It has to happen. But the problem that can quickly happen is that it becomes a group of notes. So what you can start to do here is to just break these scales up. Into triads. So you, know, you can take a position, like the any position of a scale that you you know. So let's go back to our. C, and we can learn how to play all the arpeggios rather than linearly. We can learn them within a position like that, and that immediately breaks it up. Now, let me start um, getting on to the real kind of um, not the real thing. That's that sounds awful. Uh, what I mean really is the kind of the emphasis of this lesson really was to start applying arpeggios. In a more uh, in more context, so I have I, <laughs> I apologise for this. I've got lots of chorus. Um, I'm going to choose a chord, and it's uh, A minor. So A minor, as we established earlier, is the relative minor of C major. So we can use all the arpeggios of C major over the A minor chord. So let me demonstrate how that sounds. I've got my loop set up. Hopefully this works. If it doesn't, I'll have to redo it. Thank you. Enough chorus to shake a stick at. And I'll just play um, C major arpeggios over the top of this A minor chord. I can learn how to play a C major arpeggio on one string. So C, third of C, the fifth of C. However, what's happening here? As you can hear, it's layering up a harmony, and that's a third above A minor C. Okay, so then the end up actually getting the root of C, then becomes the minor third of A minor. The third of C becomes the fifth, and then the, um, the fifth of C becomes the flat seven of A minor seven. So you end up, this is superimposition, it's just playing a triad from the scale above the chord. So, in simple terms. I can do C sus2, because that functions as a one chord as well. That sounds pretty nice. Hey, I could put some lead distortion on. Let me play all the arpeggios over this. So you have C major. F. That's just me going down the arpeggios. Let's go. Um, so we have C, E minor, E minor, F. Okay, so I'm going to pause the backing track. Okay, <laughs> so there's a lot of chorus. I apologise for that. Um, so, you know, I was just taking all the arpeggios from C major, playing them over the A minor chord, and it breaks it up. And if, in simple terms, it just makes us able to pull out different chunks. And if we have like a theme, you know, if let's say you had a nice little. I don't know, let me let me think of something a bit more uh, interesting. Maybe um. Okay, that sounds pretty like okay, quite happy. But if I do it in the minor, that was just all A minor on top top two strings. But I can take that one theme because it's the same pattern. So 
So it starts to become a phrasing thing. I know a lot, I mean, a lot, a lot of musicians talk about, you know, getting your ear involved on the guitar. And yes, that is probably the most important thing, but it's also a geometric instrument. And if you listen to any musician that plays instruments, they will play within the remit of what, how the instrument is laid out. And um, you can use that as an advantage. And that's why the importance of breaking these chord shapes and scales into arpeggio fragments gives you another view of the same information. So you're not just stuck. Um, there, that ties in a gap I was missing. Oh, good to hear, Jimmy. Fantastic. I'm hoping if there's any questions coming through, I, I'm, I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm ranting on. Um, I hope this is making some kind of sense. And if there's any, if anyone's feeling a bit like what, what's going on, then please, please do say. I want to make sure this is, you know, this is useful for people. Um, so yeah, uh, where we're going to go from here? I think, I think the next thing is to look at you know intelligent use of arpeggios. Uh, I'll use that. I'm going to title that in the next part of this lesson. Um, so in A minor, if we let's go back to our chords from A minor again. So uh, let me get my clean tone on. So um, you got A minor, relative major is C. So you have got C, D minor, E minor, F, G, A minor. B diminished, C. Now, we're in the key of A minor. That's the sixth chord of, a, of C. Now, if you want to get up, obviously the first thing you can do over A minor is play an A minor arpeggio. In fact, that's what I demonstrated earlier with. That's an arpeggio. That's a, that's the, that, that gives you the notes of A minor, which is very useful, especially for me. Um, however, if you want to start adding some more extension flavor without playing up and down the scale, and by the way, this works for chord extensions as well. So you could, for an A minor chord, you can play A minor triad, okay? But if you go to the third up from that within the scale, so A, B, C, C major, you can play a C triad over A, as I demonstrated earlier. that gives you a minor seven because you're getting it the c major then becomes the extensions because it's a third up the chords are built in thirds this is a third up from the fifth gets to the seventh okay third up from the um root sorry now if we skip the next chord d minor and play e minor over a you now get the fifth the flat seven and the ninth over a so e minor over a gives you kind of a minor nine kind of thing okay <laughs> some of these you're going to emit certain notes but you're getting that sort of thing sam bell for president <laughs> thank you um so um there we are e, e minor and, and c major work over and you know if i was um playing a rhythm part if the bass player is doing like Minus. There I went A minor to E minor. A minor. So that's kind of like implying an A to E minor chord progression, but over that A, A minor, just using the triad shapes, which just breaks up the rhythm playing completely. And don't forget, this is rhythm and lead. You know, that could be a lead line. Um, Let's let's demonstrate some of that with that my, my cheesy backing track again. Sorry about this. I should have should have had I got one looper patch available. So um, here we are. So E minor, C major, E minor. Combine. Maybe go up E minor, down and A minor up here. So like this. Small information, but good for phrasing. Dramaticism. I haven't said where properly, let alone play it. Um, okay. Oh, that's the wrong button. 
I'm a Helix user, so it's all kind of a, a bit crazy. Um, so, yeah, uh, you've got the triad starting off the third of the A minor, mm -hmm. C. You've got the triad starting mm -hmm. off the fifth of A minor, E minor. We can keep them going if you want to. We can go to G major. That's the third up again. So you have C, D minor, E minor, F, G. That gives you the seventh, the ninth, and now an eleventh. So G over G over A, which actually is the chord of the seventies, as Paul Gilbert calls it. Almost got it. Okay, so um, that chord. That's quite nice. Doing a G major to an A minor triad can sound quite nice as in a solo. Or in a or in a rhythm scenario. Let me just stick the back and track up again. So G, A minor, back to G inversion, inversion of A minor, G major, and A minor, G major. Now my combiner, so E minor. A minor, E minor, C, A minor, G, C, G. So I'm playing in a specific way, by the way. It's like triple tacker or something. It's crazy. Um, so uh, I'm playing in a specific way. And some of you might be going, well, I don't, it sounds a bit fusion-y or it sounds a bit like this. So I have an opinion about how it sounds. And first of all, just check that out, the, 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 what it reminds you of. But then, you know, there's no better time spent than with a loop pedal and just mapping out, even just writing them down in front of you. You know, take a voicing of an arpeggio, just any, any of these two string or three string voicings of a triad. And then, um, of major and minor, stick a chord on underneath, map out the scale it comes from, and then try all the triads over the top. But the idea of starting a triad off every third note of the of the scale relative to the chord that you're playing over is going to give you those upper extensions, which is which is everywhere. It's all over the place. And um, again, like I say, bringing yourself into this smaller information on the fretboard gives you a bit more um, opportunity to kind of phrase more musically. Um, cool. Very useful and clear stuff. Thank you, Rafa. Much appreciated. So at this point, um, I'm just going to, if there's any other questions coming in before I, I, I might show some other little practice methods of just developing um, how I might practice some, some of this stuff in terms of like application and also in terms of the actual seeing it. Hi, David. Hey, Sam. I just wanted to let you know that you're doing an awesome job. And I know that sometimes doing live workshops like this you're wondering how people are reacting because you're you're teaching but this is almost a first where there's very few questions everything is clear and people love it so keep on doing it you're great i will interrupt awesome. if we have questions and then at the end we'll have some q a but so far everything is super clear you're doing an awesome job cool thank you david back to you <laughs> okay hey I, I did it again <laughs> <laughs> okay so um yeah, let's uh go, let's go back. So I've kind of we've, we've what I've done here is we've discovered a cave of information. We've gone into it, and we got a bit worried, and we've come back out into the daylight again. And now, but now we know what the cave looks like. We know where it is. We know what the weather's like. We know kind of what to expect and how we reacted to being in that cave. So now we just need to uh, come back out and then reassess how we're going to go back in, and that is simply mapping out the fretboard again. So if you take We've already started this journey in C major. Then your next job is to do that on the next set of strings within that first pattern. So then learn it here on the D, G, and B string. You've got five, five, five. This is C major, by the way, sorry. Then you've got the inversion, nine, sorry, ten, nine, eight. That comes out of the good old that shape. Then you've got your C shape, 14, 12, 13. So now you've got, ah. And, and that's just, playing with it is the first thing. 
that you should do. Just just take one area. See if you can move it. Just on those top four, I'd probably sometimes, I don't know if this will come through, but I get my trusty metronome and I might give myself, you know, give myself a time to get to them. Combining your fretboard visualization work with timing work. Then the next set of strings. So let's just run through those patterns. You've got um, C major in the open position, which is C, uh, sorry, two, sorry, three, two, open, A, D, G. So imagine your first finger's kind of getting the fret behind there. Then you've got this one, the Hendrixy shape, which is the seven, five, five. Then you've got your E shape, 10, 10, nine. And then you've got your C shape again, 15, 14, 12. And what you might do in the matter of this is you play that back to back, or maybe you make a chord sequence. And um, I'm a big fan of like old 90s video games, and there's games like Final Fantasy and Sonic and uh, Zelda. And a lot of their soundtracks, sort of the more intense ones, often the compositional style was kind of just triads, but being moved, not randomly, of course, with, with good intention. But... Um, just, you know, major triad and then upper minor third, a major triad. So you'd have like a chord progression of C to E flat. To be B, for example. And there's probably some theoretical ways we can address that. But for now, we're not using that. We're just taking a root movement of C, E flat, B. We might go C, E flat, and B, C. Now, I've managed to play that fairly smoothly, but let's say in your practice, it might be like, okay, C. Then you go, oh, E flat. Ooh, got to scratch your head and go, okay, where's the nearest E flat? Well, I found there's an E flat here on the, on the G string, eight fret, eight, eight, six. And then I found my inversions of E flat relative to that, really. That helped me out. Like that. Then maybe you take B next and you have to find it. But every time you find it, you're reinforcing not only your root note knowledge of the pattern, but your knowledge of the shape itself and um, your ability to change between them. And what I like about this exercise is the manipulation of the improvisational mindset that you're, you know, you're, you can take your time, by the way. It's not like you have, you don't have to, if it's too, too fast with the metronome, just do it free time, first of all. But I encourage getting the metronome out when you can because it will enforce you to kind of, where is it? And you're training that function. And even if it's only two positions you can go between with any of these chords, that's great. You know, it's going to help. Then you might take a chord progression, you know, something a bit more... Um, uh, <laughs> and I, 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 for me, I've been doing a lot of um, sort of session-y work, playing bands and things and recording for artists, and often they want parts over that sort of thing. And sometimes, as a rhythm player, you know, you can be using that's probably a bit busy, but you get the idea that you can move around. So I'd C major, D minor. Yeah, I was using D minor with the two note per string thing on top as well. Great for little rhythm fills. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, there we are. So that was just a, a random chord sequence of just D to C to D minor. Then take it to your common progressions. Like that. So you take C. F, A minor, G, C. In fact, if, if anyone here is a fan of uh, Corey Wong, um, 
uh, you know, he, a lot of the stuff he's doing is actually breaking these three-string voicings into two-string voicings for little thirds. I noticed David said so he likes the chord wiggle. So that's something you can be experimenting with, different ways of playing these triads. That's actually a Cory Wong trick I, I stole. Um, someone's asked a good question here. Sam, I notice you hold the pick very close to the tip. Does this facilitate faster arpeggios? Um, oh, I don't really know. Uh, let me... In, in, in a weird way, I, I find that for, if I'm doing like some sweet picking, I'm going to probably make myself look bad here, but... <laughs> If it's too close, I end up, it slips, and it doesn't sound very articulate. But I actually find when there's a bit more pick coming out. It's a bit easier. That's probably sounds awful. I don't know. I can't really tell how I'm sounding. Um, but the idea is, I mean, this is a Jazz 3, uh, a small one. Um, so it probably looks like I'm holding it closer. But this... Whatever you find comfortable um, for playing these, by the way, I'm, you know, I'm playing an Ibanez and, you know, I love my hair metal and rock and, and oh, I love lots of stuff, but I've got my thing and you've got to find, you know, whatever your thing is, just make it work. I, I don't really believe there's like a set, you know, string gauge, pick gauge, holding the pick a particular way. I think it's actually the felt, the felt sense of playing. And the, 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 the big thing you need to, we should ask yourself is, you know, can you make it sound? Can you make a good sound? Can you play in time? Can, do you feel synchronized? Um, does it feel comfortable? I think those are the, the main things. And if, if I mean, Eddie Van Halen held it with two fingers and backwards and, and he'd managed to do some amazing things and some people don't even use a pick. Um, so, you know, it, find, find what works for you. So that's my short but very long answer to that. I hope that helps. But yeah, generally, I hold it a medium I, really what what counts is how much pick goes below the string and i think something with arpeggios and this is actually and it, to bring it back to arpeggios a bit um with 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 these sort of i think guitarists get nervous when you have less information on a fretboard and this is something actually just to address if you're practicing this for the first time especially if you've been practicing a lot of scalic work <laughs> You know, that position one blues scale feels like a lot of value for fretboard. You know, there's a lot of lot of lot of notes there, and um, that's great. And it's really good for your, yeah, you know, it's really good for your speedy licks. However, um, when it comes to making melodies or making phrases, you need to break that down into smaller things. And when you do that, you're forced to think more rhythmically and more dynamically. And sometimes when you have a pattern like this. It's a bit like, oh, I don't really want to... What can I do with that? I can't go... I can't do my licks if it's just... So what arpeggios do is they kind of force you into a corner to think of them in different ways. You might take an A, a, a minor arpeggio on one string. That's the Guthrie thing. So um, taking it on one string is probably the uh, one way to start getting more comfortable. You can even step off. You could do A minor. And then here, take your three-string voicing with the uh, D minor shape there. There's the top bit. You know, you can, so you can sort of... It's like a train station. You've got the first train station. And, um, there's a train station down the road for me called Barnum. The next train station after that is Ford. Then there's Angerin. Okay, and then Angerin. Oh, actually, I don't want to get off Angerin. I'm going to get off at Brighton. So I go up further. And at Brighton, I come out and I go to the coffee shop. And I just, you know, I investigate that area. So you can start to sort of use your single string and ver vertical and horizontal with the arpeggios. But you're going to feel a bit awkward if you've never done this sort of thing before with arpeggios. It feels like you're kind of exposed because you don't have the kind of luxury of being able to 
you move up and down a scale and say a lot of information. The arpeggio, unless you're doing a sweep arpeggio, of course, where you can say a lot of information in one go. But in terms of these three string shapes, particularly, really kind of puts you in a corner. Um, one thing you could do with arpeggios as well is you know look at ways of enclosing the arpeggio of the scale. So I'm going to take um, the A minor arpeggio up here. So nine, ten, eight. And then if I'm thinking in the key of A minor, I know I've got A minor here. So getting your scale patterns mixed in with the chord. Now, the, the exercise I did say earlier was taking your arpeggios. That helps, but if you want to simplify that a bit, you just take your A minor arpeggios and see if you can fit them in the three note string or cage system. So you start to phrase with them. That was just all A minor. I was thinking A minor. Now, if I was thinking A minor scale, I'm probably going to play more linear stuff. If I'm thinking about the arpeggio, I'm probably going to find... Or if I'm thinking about the arpeggios I can use over the top of that, if I'm thinking um, I can start to go between A minor and E minor like I did before... Um, the next thing as well is then to take that to a chord progression. So let's say I had... Actually, let's do something a bit more um, random. A minor to um, E. So seeing E major and A minor arpeggios next to each other in any position. That might be a helpful way of practicing this stuff, and then you can take a, uh, your metronome or something, or um, A minor, C, uh, F, E, E, and now I was just thinking of two, two arpeggios there. I was probably play that gives me six different notes and stuff. Some of them are shared, of course, between the chords, but six um, notes to kind of well. Two shapes to kind of give me a six-note pull. It's not quite six notes, sorry. I'm kind of messing up here. Five notes um, to kind of to, to use, to phrase with. And um, that's another really healthy way. This is chord tone soloing. This is what everyone is talking about on the old YouTube channels, you know, playing over chords. Well, this is, this is it. You learn your arpeggios. And if you can relate them to your chord shape and play them in different sets of strings, like I was mentioning earlier, you can start to be a bit more um, freer with that information. So I know we're coming up to about six o'clock now. Um, if there's any questions or any um, Man. anything we can go for. Sam, it's, it's wow. Like you uh, expanded my mind a little bit, like so many cool and simple and practical ideas. Um, wow, <laughs> that is awesome, man. Oh, cool. Um, I'd, I'd like to, there are a few questions here, but first, um, that thing that you just played with the arpeggios, kind of a, a swingy thing, where you could hear the chords behind, you know what I'm referring to there? Yeah. Um, can you, uh, can you touch on that just a little bit on the, there's the swing element, obviously. I think that kind of playing is so cool because you don't need a backing track to hear the chords and it's just super pleasant to me to hear can you talk about that just a little bit yeah i think a good way of starting this if you're if you want to get into that is as simple as mapping i talked about the analogy of setting the table for dinner and if i took the chord shapes if i took an a minor e, e minor shape and then an e7 as a c shape or an e7 as an a shape just whatever chord shapes you know in that area and I think addressing what I was saying, how it kind of feels awkward just to play the chord notes out of that. But you, 
for, first of all, you just try. You just imagine in slow motion, like a slow motion chord progression going by, and just play parts of it. As slowly as you need to, but you, as, make sure you can hear it. Then you start to then give yourself timing. Now, I was playing a swing. I mean, I'm not a jazz player at all or anything like that, but a really good one is to get the metronome. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I don't know if you can hear that quite, but I'm using that as my mm -hmm. reference. So A minor, E, A minor, E. I might just practice like an exercise of just mapping them first of all as like a little lick. And then you might... Sorry, I don't know, I'm starting to go pentatonic. It's, but, it's um, cool, it's great. At the swing thing, though, uh, that, I mean, the, the practicing the metronome with no accent and then trying to count it. So I've got it on like 57 beats per minute. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I mean, people could even set up, I mean, I know most phones now, you can take away beats one and three, one and, three and just have it going. Yeah. I, it's a really healthy practice and something that would, it really kicks my butt, to be honest. Like it keeps your your timing really involved, but also it allows you to leave space a bit and then start to phrase of the arpeggios. And naturally, you go to more more of a swung thing, if, depending on your influences. But you can, I mean, you can, I mean, you can practice it with it with an actual three, two, three, four. You can go between straight and swung. Mm -hmm. And I, I think my swing stuff comes from Van Halen yeah. uh, and Steve Vai rather than uh, the jazz guys. But um, yeah, all the same. Yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah. And what's cool too is that uh, without necessarily talking about the swing, but that way of uh, um, illustrating the chords without having to play the chords, where you can hear the, the tune without you know having the backing track, that's so useful, not just in jazz or bebop, but also in like, uh, well, anything really. It just makes things super melodic. And you, you hear that a lot in some of the 80s anthems, like rock anthems and, and all that stuff. It's all arpeggio based. I think it's just mm -hmm. awesome. I remember uh, when I was uh, in school, in music school, years ago, but one of the exercises that was really helpful, um, we had studied a few arpeggio shapes uh, I think it was just all triads. Maybe we got into four note arpeggios, but the, the teacher gave us an assignment. Okay, I want you to um, think of a very simple chord progression, you know, four chords, and then write something or, you know, on your guitar with those arpeggios. And then next, next lesson, you'll come here, you'll play it in front of the class, and it had to be obvious the chords that I was highlighting, suggesting with that. I think that might be a good approach for people wanting to get into that kind of uh, study. Yeah. Where, um, and if you don't know what to do, just just pick a blues on one, four, five, and and write a, a simple tune with those arpeggios highlighting the changes, and such so so useful. I think that's an important distinction to make as well. Like, I've heard Tom Quayle say this. He talks about making a model of a phrase rather than improvising straight away and trying to expect it all to suddenly gel. I spent a lot of time creating small scenarios, music chord progression or, or develop an arpeggio lick, or even tabbing out a position of the major scale, then the arpeggios within that position, and then the chord shapes around that position, just tabbing it out for myself. Paul Gilbert, one of my favorite guitar players, he even, I've seen him talk about when he's preparing certain parts of the album, the more complicated stuff, he actually makes fretboard diagrams for himself of the arpeggio shape so you can actually kind of just chill out and just kind of get creative with it and just yeah it frees up your mind to actually use it rather than worry about oh i've got to memorize it all and improvise straight away yeah, yeah i think that's an important thing too for people wanting to get into this uh, maybe maybe it's new for them um uh, sure you need to learn some shapes but um don't get stuck in it make music with it right away take small fragments mm -hmm. you don't have to learn the whole thing just small fragments and make music, be musical, and then it'll come out naturally in your playing.
Um, I ha we have one question here, uh, more technical. David ask is asking you about your, um, your picking, if you're always using the pick or if you do hybrid picking on the arpeggios. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to probably start to play some patterns here, which I didn't talk about, because this is something uh, important to address in your, your playing as well, like stylistically how you wish to kind of make it sound. So technique for me used to be like, OK, pick everything, legato, shred, and there's this and this. But actually, then it starts to become more about how, how I want it to sound and feel. So, for example, you know, you know, hybrid picking versus the two different sounds. Mm -hmm. So that's that's something I you know I, if I one thing I'd love doing. So that's like a G G add nine arpeggio. But I'm using my middle finger to hybrid pick the top note rather than. I can do it just about, but the hybrid pick means I don't have to move around so much. Mm -hmm. um, I might, I mean, I love like Knopfler and stuff, and he would often. Yeah. There's little, just little, like, I need to cut my fingernails. I noticed about 10 minutes before the session, I was like, oh no. <laughs> um, so I, it, for me, hyper picking is easier with, with short fingernails because then you get the softer attack. And it's yeah. a bit more, it's definitely different from the pick. But I get this question a lot, and just to address it quickly, I, I learned to hybrid pick by accident because I was doing a lot of chords, chord work in like theatre gigs and things like that, where I'd be grabbing, pianoing the chords, I call it, where you attack you, you, mm -hmm. the crab technique, where you hold the chord like that. And, it, and hybrid picking is no different for me. It's resting your finger on the string you're about to go to. Just using that stuff, it just makes it actually from playing eight string hmm. because I had to mute all the time. And I found that if, if I move my hand too much, it would sound messy. So the hybrid picking kind of came out of a necessity to make it tighter and more articulate, but not as aggressive sounding because you're missing out on the pick attack for the metal thing. Yeah. So I yeah, mix it up sense. in short. So I mix it up. Uh, that's great. Um, there are a few more questions. Um, but people are kind of answering each other's questions in the chat, which is awesome. And everybody's getting okay. tons out of this. We're going to do a, we're going to do a, a giveaway here. I'm going to put you back in the green room. Well, first, I'm, I'm going to remove this comment, but I, I don't know where it is. There's so many comments. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> um, I'll put you back in the green room. I'm going to share the giveaway, and uh, I'll have you back in just a few minutes. OK. So. Um, in this session, we have two giveaways. The first one is the care package. We're giving away one of these every live session. You need to be live to participate. This is offered by Diderio and Sweetwater Music. You're going to get an instrument cable, 15 feet instrument cable. A clip-on tuner. I can't live without these. They're awesome and so accurate. And they're great. And then pack of strings. This is worldwide, by the way. And if you've seen other sessions, you know how, to, how it works. It's a random drawing. And in order to participate, you need to comment live. And I, I mentioned that at the beginning. But if you don't know where to comment, you need a, a YouTube account, which is free, or being logged into Facebook. And that's the only way we can verify that you're here, unfortunately. But the good news is that if you commented very earlier in the session, you are entered already. And you don't need to co to comment 10 times for more chances. Just one comment is enough. So say hello, ask a question, just be positive. Um, and then if anybody was rude or racist or anything like that, they're out already. But you guys are great. It hadn't it, it hasn't happened. So I'm going to share my screen. So far there are 197 entries for this. So I'm going to share the screen with the. Uh, the drawing window. Here we go. And see the 200. There's some a few last minute things here. So right now we're playing for the the care package. This is worldwide. I'll, I'll be shipping all of these next week. So who's gonna win this care package? 205 last minute, last second, because I'm about to click. And 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 
five, four, three, two, one. Let's see who is the happy winner. This care package from the Dario. By the way, if you won something yesterday, uh, Arno, we have a new winner. I was going to say, if you already won something and you're there live, you can win again. But Arno, congratulations. I'll be shipping this to you if you email me at support at guitarplayback.com. I'm going to write this in the chat. Support two Ps at guitarplayback.com. And for those of you thinking that too, I'm going to send an email saying that I'm Arno. It's not going to work. It's all verified in the back, so can't do that. But Arno, please email me. You'd be surprised at how many people don't claim their prizes. So do it right now. And congratulations. Now, I have something else to give away. And um, Sam was talking about... Uh, was talking about uh, chorus, which I love, and people will love the chorus, by the way, Sam, so no, <laughs> no worries. Uh, this is the Modulation Machine by Universal Audio, uh, which uh, is brand new. I have opened it, but I haven't even plugged it in because I want you to have the, the, uh, the scent of a brand new pedal, but I just wanted to show you. This is what it is. It does just anything modulation. It's pretty awesome. And it's by Universal Audio, so if you know Universal Audio, you know that they, they are great. I use their plugins all the time. And I don't know if they just started making pedals. Maybe not. Do you know, Sam? I, I, I know they've got had integrated stuff within some of the interfaces, but that's yeah. all I know. Yeah. It's so really I, cool, use, uh, yeah, I use an Apollo uh, sound card, and yeah, all the plugins are great. But this is a hardware thing. So we're going to do another mm -hmm. drawing here to win this, and we'll do this worldwide again. So I already have a bunch of entries. Arno, you're still in for this, by the way, too. Everybody who is live and comments. So still have a few uh, seconds here. I'm going to share this again. So that, that was the last winner. I'm going to click that uh, draw again button. And if you're watching this on Facebook, that works too. So all the entries are taking into account. And uh, right now, there's 219, so you have one chance on 219 entries, 220. So who's going to win this? This is shipped worldwide. Thank you so much, Sweetwater, and thank you, Universal Audio, for providing this. And let's see. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Let's see who won this. Wow, congratulations. Engelbert, you have won this brand new Ostra modulation machine pedal. Uh, please email me, the sooner the better. Whoops, there you go. This is yours, it'll be shipped to you uh, wherever you live and I'll pay the shipping. So you're in support at guitarplayback.com. Um, except that if you're looking at this in the chat, don't email that address because there's a typo. <laughs> if you can email me right now, that would be awesome because I don't want you to miss out to claim your prize. So, yeah, that's yours. So we did our giveaways and I need to tell you about the grand prize too. Most of you know about this already, but these workshops, there are, let's see, we had Steve Stein Monday. Yesterday, we were supposed to have Robert Renman. He was stuck in a snowstorm. He left. And uh, Sam, I'm bringing you back on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the green gets a little cold sometimes. <laughs> uh, yesterday, we were supposed to have Robert Redman. He canceled because of the snowstorm. So I took that session. So he got a bonus workshop. Robert will be with us Monday at 2 p.m. U.S. Mountain Time for a workshop. All that to say that all these workshops, um, if you missed a live event or if you want to make you the most out of this, you can get the, some supplemental content with the workshops and also the edited version where you just get the teaching section. And all of that is free. And for that, 
you need to claim your lifetime access for free at guitarplayback.com slash workshops. And when you do that, you will also be entered to win this brand new PRS guitar, which is an SE Custom 24 frets. Um, I chose the color because I, I just love Sunburst and it plays amazing. It's an amazing guitar. So it's almost brand new. Played <laughs> three minutes because I couldn't resist. So I play, I used it in yesterday's sex session a little bit, but again, it's worldwide. So do that. The replays are going to be available on YouTube and Facebook for a few days, but they're going to be removed and your chance to get lifetime access for free and all the backing tracks and stuff is a uh, limited time to so do it now. And that way you can be entered. We're going to be drawing uh, the winner uh, randomly next week. So make sure you claim that for next week. Uh, last thing, um, I already edited the replays for Steve's video and I added some backing tracks and stuff and my workshop also, they're being uploaded right now on the back end. So you'll get that in about an hour. Um, I think Sam, you said, you mentioned something about some, uh, PDFs or something. Yeah, so I've got some PDFs of those three string and two string arpeggios that might be helpful awesome. uh, for people. Um, Perfect. I'll, I'll be added, adding some backing tracks too. I took some notes as far as what would be good for what you're teaching. Okay. And um, Sam, anything you'd like to, what are you up to these days? Anything you'd like to share? What are you doing? Well, I'm, uh, you know, I appreciate being able to come here and uh, to teach. For guitar playback it's always a pleasure so thank Anytime. you very much and thank you thank you for everyone tuning in as well i hope it's been somewhat helpful at the moment i'm a, i'm head of guitar at a university in Chich uh, in uk called water bear college of music so uh that's associated with like revere and rob chapman and cory wong and all that but i'm the head of guitar department for that uh teaching technique and then i've been working for lick library of course a lot and i got a band called mask of judas we're writing some new stuff and I'm always uploading to YouTube and Instagram. So if anybody has enjoyed some of my uh, my teaching style, I'd, uh, please please do say hi. Don't don't be a stranger. Um, I'm always sharing things and whatnot. So just guitar stuff, really. So yeah, it's yeah. really good stuff. You should definitely check it out. Thank you, uh, everyone. That's it for today. Tomorrow, my friend Jesse Solomon, who's uh, an awesome teacher, uh, local guy. So he'll be coming here in the studio, and we'll be doing it together. We'll teach you about uh, a different kind of session. I think it's going to be beneficial for everyone. And it's basically how to um, digest new knowledge that you're learning and making it your own. So it's going to be very practical for everyone out there. And I uh, hope to see you tomorrow. Sam, thanks again so much. Thank you. And everyone, I will see you tomorrow. Take care, everyone.